collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambos. Coming up on the programme this week, the EU's foreign policy chief meets her Russian counterpart. There are some issues of disagreements. We are open and frank about that. For sure, we have a different assessment of the conflict in eastern Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. But we have also on that crisis exchanged views on how we can move forward. A new NGO on the island is introducing people to some of Cyprus' remote and hidden gems. Almost uh, none of the Cypriots knows these beautiful places and we really want to promote them, either as a touristic, either as an information places or any other idea. Maybe some people even to move there to renovate and rebuild those uh, villages. We'll get advice on what to do if you come across a baby bird that's fallen out of its nest. It's very important not to interfere because then baby birds do not get the chance to learn those basic survival skills from their parents. And after a five-year hiatus, the Cyprus Motor Show returns next week. The exhibition will be anyway impressive very much informative, uh, which is a major objective, and people we have the opportunity really to get acquainted of new trends and possibilities and brands and so forth. The EU's foreign policy chief, Federica Mogherini, was in Russia earlier this week for talks with her counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. After their talks, she had this to say. We always believe in the European Union that dialogue, constructive, open dialogue, frank dialogue is the way. And uh, uh, this is true also for a relevant, not only neighbor, but uh, a global player as the Russian Federation is. There are some issues of disagreement. We are open and frank about that. For sure, we have a different assessment of uh, uh, the conflict in eastern Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. But we have uh, also on that crisis, exchanged views on how we can move forward uh, on an agreed roadmap, which is the full implementation of the Minsk agreements by all sides, both on the security and on the political aspects. And uh, we believe uh, in the European Union that this is even more urgent to do after the death of uh, uh, one of the OSC monitors yesterday in, uh, in the east of Ukraine. We uh, discussed ways in which we can work together more uh, to, full, to guarantee a full implementation of uh, the Minsk agreements by all sides uh, and uh, uh, ways to put an end to the conflict in East uh, uh, of Ukraine. We also exchanged on uh, um, something that maybe you could refer as a systemic disagreement, I think you mentioned uh, it like this, uh, which is the position of the European Union of not recognizing the annexation of Crimea. This is a principal position we are going to keep, not only the European Union, but also other uh, partners we have in the world. We had uh, a long exchange on a series of bilateral uh, issues. On some of them, we have uh, difficulties to overcome. Uh, through cooperation and dialogue. On others, uh, we have a good level of uh, interaction and cooperation that is mutually beneficial to our people, both uh, Russian citizens and uh, citizens in the European Union. And we have decided to uh, work on uh, these common issues, the example of the counter-terrorist dialogue, counter dialogue that has resumed in the last uh, months is a good one. Uh, but we also identified further areas of useful cooperation to be strengthened, like uh, uh, cooperation in the Arctic or the Nordic dimension, or uh, exchanges uh, on the cultural, educational or research uh, fields, and I could continue on a long list. We started uh, to go through our uh, common agenda of priorities when it comes to global and uh, regional issues, foreign policy issues, uh, starting with uh, uh, the situation in Syria. I thanked uh, for Minister Lavrov for the active participation of the Russian Federation to the Brussels conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, where we not only reaffirmed the very sustained uh, humanitarian support of the international community to the Syrian people, both within Syria and in the region. The European Union is and will continue to be the first humanitarian donor for Syrians. 
And uh, we uh, share the same uh, approach that uh, access of humanitarian aid uh, has to be improved. We count on uh, uh, Russian work, including through the Astana process, uh, to uh, help moving forward also in this respect. Uh, and we shared uh, uh, views on how to work more closely on the political solution of the war in Syria. I believe we share an interest, that of putting an end to this war that is costing so many lives, that is costing so, many, so much pain to Syrians, first of all, but also in the broader region. And we share uh, the uh, interest to guarantee that that part of uh, our neighborhood is uh, uh, finally finding peace, stability and security, defeating Daesh and guaranteeing uh, a democratic, uh, inclusive, secular, uh, united future for Syria within uh, the framework of the relevant UN Security Council resolutions through intra-Syrian talks uh, that are uh, UN facilitated in uh, Geneva and on the basis of uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2254. We exchanged views on how to follow up our uh, work uh, in this respect, especially on the political uh, side. Other issues of common interest uh, and concern when it comes to foreign and uh, global and regional security uh, include Libya, the uh, peace process between Israel and Palestine, where the European Union and Russia work well together within the Quartet and with our Arab partners, including with the Arab Peace Initiative, the full implementation of the nuclear deal with Iran, and uh, in general terms, the encouragement of a more constructive approach uh, across the Gulf and in the broader Middle East. But we will also discuss in the continuation of our talks uh, some other issues of mutual concern where the Russian Federation and the European Union can constructively work together, not only for the sake of European and Russian interests, but also for global stability and multilateralism and respect of international law when it comes to, for instance, the issue of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula or the peace process in Afghanistan and our common work on some key global issues for us, being it uh, uh, a global responsibility sharing when it comes to uh, managing uh, huge migratory flows, or uh, the work to implement uh, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change or the Sustainable Development Goals. And in general terms, I believe our common work can be essential to strengthen the UN system and the multilateral approach and what we call a uh, rules-based global order. Again, this doesn't uh, delete or overcome all the difficulties and all the disagreements we have, especially on some areas and especially on the issue of Ukraine. But there are also fields of cooperation, and we are determined to uh, increase the level of coordination, cooperation, uh, exploring uh, possible ways in which Russia and the European Union can be useful to solve some of the crises we're facing in the world of today. We live in difficult times. It's times when uh, uh, not even one single inch, uh, one single centimeter to use European standards of cooperation can be wasted or underestimated. So we have the responsibility to do the utmost to find common grounds and common solutions. EU Foreign Policy Chief Federica Mogherini talking to the press during her visit to Russia earlier this week. You can subscribe to the Cyprus News Digest on iTunes for free and get the program downloaded to your phone or tablet so you can listen anytime, anywhere. I'd like to bet that however long you've been in Cyprus, you very probably haven't visited some of our remote mountain villages, particularly those that have been abandoned. Well, a bicommunal organization has set up some camping trips to the great outdoors. Kiriakos Stupas from CY explains. What we want through these activities is uh, to bond uh, Cypriots and at the same time explore the uh, places that are not so famous. Where did you find all these ancient villages? Because I know some of them, but you must have gone off-roading to locate some of the more remote areas? Uh, let's say that we did a lot of research. Uh, we asked local people, we asked friends, we went to Cyprus Tourist Organization, we asked old people, internet, any place that was possible to get information, we tried. 
After that, we spent almost one month driving, searching, and uh, yeah, the result was was really good. We found the places. You found the places. And tell us about the trip itself, this last one that was the camping to the deserted villages. How many people came? Okay, we had uh, 58 participants, but we received um, over than 150 applications, and that was really surprised for us. Uh, hang on, stop there. How do you filter out who can go and who can't? Why can't you take all 150? Unfortunately, for this trip, we didn't have enough uh, space for all of them or enough grants. So we had to select and we gave priorities to people that they are coming from other countries. Let's say Erasmus students who lived in Cyprus only for one year. We gave priority to people who, with uh, less opportunities, small communities like uh, Turkish Cypriot, uh, Armenians, people who live in mountains. And... Uh, Basically, that's how we select the participants. So, will you be doing another one of these to give the others that were rejected a chance? We hope that we will do it. If not the same, maybe with similar thematic. Uh, for example, we're already planning the next uh, trip that is going to be in one month, and it's going to be to the abandoned village Finicas which uh, we didn't include it to the previous trip uh, due to the fact that uh, it's uh, one hour walking to go there. So we decided to do it individually. And when you get there, are you going to camp at the village or camp where the bus stops and walk there and have a day trip? We are still thinking about it. We are not sure yet. We will see. Now, what impressed me was the fact that you get grants from the Education Ministry to help you with these adventures, let's call them. Mm -hmm. But you are also able, therefore, to keep the cost minimal for the participants. And that must be pretty important when you're aiming at young people, many of whom these days are unemployed. Yeah, that is correct. On February, we apply for a, a grant from National Agency of Cyprus, we receive an amount and uh, we ask from the participant the minimum money that uh, it costs for them just to participate. And you've bought your own tents, your own sleeping bags. You provide everything, it seems. Even food, yes, that is correct. Uh, we also got as many informations from uh, Cyprus Tourist Organization. We also receive information from the local muhtars and communities. So, yes. And the idea, as we said at the beginning, is to get Cypriots to explore this lovely island because they do tend, forgive me, to go in the summer to the beach and maybe in the winter to the snow. But I wonder how many Cypriots really do go off the beaten track to see some of the beautiful things that we've got here. Unfortunately, what we realised through our experience is that Almost uh, none of the Cypriots knows these beautiful places and we really want to promote them either as a touristic, either as an information places or any other idea. Maybe some people even to move there to re renovate and rebuild those uh, villages. Yeah, because a lot of the youngsters from the vill mountain villages are moving to the towns, aren't they? Uh, not anymore. It used to be something like this, let's say 20, 30, 40 years ago. But now we see that uh, the young people, uh, because of the unemployment, they are moving back to the villages. Not, not all of them, of course, but uh, we see that there is a, a percentage, an increasing of people moving to these areas. And see why. Do you tell us about the name of the organisation? Because a lot of people, when we say it, of course, might think we're talking about the letter C and the letter Y, yes. but it's actually spelt S-E-W-H-Y. -E mm -hmm. Clever. How did you come up with it? Actually, it was an idea of our participants, and we like it, so we use it now. Yeah, it's a nice way to say again Cyprus, let's say. So what else is coming up? Then you mentioned that you're going to be having one of these every couple of months, I think. And that means you've got to find new ideas. What have you already done and what are you going to be doing? OK, this, uh, this educational trip to Abandon Village is the third one that we did. 
the previous was the top 10 uh, viewpoints of Cyprus. And the first one was uh, to travel uh, through the corners of Cyprus, uh, driving uh, next to the seaside. About the future, we are planning the next month to make a one-day trip to visit uh, just uh, one, two places. Uh, we are also hoping to manage to make a, a three-day trip with camping to both uh, sites, one next to Apostolos Andreas in uh, North Cyprus and the other one in Trodos area in the south part. And uh, the third one, uh, we are planning to do it uh, during the June, and it's going to be to the mines of Cyprus. Oh, that would be fascinating. Yeah. Because we have a lot of mines, and a lot of different things were mined here. I mean, there's copper, there's umber, there's lots of things. Mm -hmm. And we are also aiming to find uh, the story behind each uh, mine, why it's been abandoned, what happened to the local villagers, the people, and stuff like that. So it looks like you're spreading from not just the geography of Cyprus, but also perhaps the history. You can say that, yes, as well. For us, it's important to learn our history and at the same time to find a common place to communicate. Not uh, any, not just Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots, or any Cypriots. That's the idea. Any Cypriot to join us talk a bit about our history, about our culture, and at the same time, learn about each other. And tell me something, are you also possibly thinking that when you're not doing trips as such, you could have like a sort of cafe conversation with people about some of these things? Yes, we do that, but uh, actually these ideas are coming through chats in uh, coffee shops and places like this. Because every time before, after these uh, events, we ask uh, participants to tell us their opinion, their ideas. So every time we are not sure about what is going to be the future, what activities are we planning to do, because it's up to them. So you'd like suggestions even perhaps on your Facebook group? Of course. We even have a questionnaire that uh, every time participants have to answer so we will get a feedback of what we do, what we did so far, and what we, we should do in the future. Well, that's great ideas coming from Kiriakos Stupas of CY. You can find them on Facebook, or you can get in touch with me and I'll pass on the details. You too can get to know the hidden beauty and the hidden gems of our beautiful island. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. It's nesting time in the bird world. If you're lucky enough to have a garden, doubtless you know that nests are all over the place. So many different species, so many beautiful birds. Sadly, some are better at nest building than others. And that means that occasionally a baby may fall out of the nest. What should you do? Well, BirdLife Cyprus recommends there are certain things you shouldn't do. So let's talk to them about what happens if you find a baby bird that's still too small to fly. Elena Markitan is here. Elena, people do tend to want to rescue, and that's not always the best thing, is it? Yes, it's very hard to resist a a cute baby bird on the ground that's um, calling and... The first reaction is, ah, oh, it's calling for help, it's alone, it's, uh, the parents are not around, I can't see the nest, what should I do? The first thing that we should do in this case is to see whether the bird is injured or not. If it's injured, then we immediately come to its rescue and we either call BirdLife Cyprus or the Game and Fauna Service, which runs a rehabilitation center for wildlife. If it's not injured, then we should assess whether at which stage of its development the bird is currently at. If it hasn't got any feathers or, on it, then it's still a nestling, which means that it has fallen from its nest. In that case, we'll try and locate the nest if possible. If we can't locate the nest, then 
Mm, if we could make a makeshift nest of some sort, like a, a basket and put some um, leaves or dried grass in it and hang it close to where we found the bird, away from danger, away from cats or... Um, that is the biggest problem here, isn't it? There yeah. are so many cats yes. all over the place that you almost don't dare leave a baby bird on the ground hoping its parents can do something because the chances are a cat will get there first. Yes. So uh, if we can make that makeshift nest, then we, should, uh, we could leave the bird there and hang, hang that makeshift nest somewhere and keep a close watch and see if the, if the parents return uh, to feed it. If yes, then that's all we need to do and then we should step away. Uh, if the parents don't return within uh, two or three hours, then we should call for help, either BirdLife Cyprus or the Game and Fauna Service. So if the bird has some um, feathers and um, feathery down, um, then it's probably a fledging, uh, which means that it can leave the nest, but it's still not ready to fly. In that case, it's normal to see those uh, fledglings on the ground and the parents do still return to feed it. The best thing we can do is just uh, walk away. There's nothing for us to do. There's no reason to intervene. If we see that it's close, uh, it's near a road or there are cats nearby, then we can try and move it gently on a bush or somewhere away from danger, but not away from the area where we found it. It's very important not to interfere because then birds, baby birds, um, do not get the chance to learn those basic survival skills from their parents. So if we do need any help in identifying uh, what stage of development the baby bird we found is uh, is in uh, or we need any help then the first thing you could do before picking up the bird is call us for advice. And you, these days you can take a photo with your phone can't you? Exactly. And yeah. send it and say this is it what mm -hmm. should I do because you can tell immediately whether or not it's a nestling or a fledgling. But the other thing is that birds have been known I think if there is something wrong with a baby bird mm -hmm. to actually kick it out of the nest haven't they? Yes. I've, I know that years ago in England we rescued tiny birds that mm -hmm. had no feathers whatsoever and obviously mother had decided that there was an inherent problem with mm -hmm. this baby because the others were fine and just booted it out of the nest. Yes, sometimes uh, parents do that to their nestlings. Um, so it's... Uh, we should really let nature do its work and only if it's really necessary then we should interfere. And it's very important, even if we do take a bird and rescue it and wait for a Bird Life Cyprus or the Game and Fauna Service to give advice, or uh, it's important not to feed it anything. The, the, least, the best we can do is just put it in a box with some holes and a soft uh, um, lining, lining um, and just give it some water. The only exception uh, when, we, when we're talking about this is swifts and barn swallows. Those immediately, um, these uh, baby birds, when they're ready to leave the nest, they fly as soon as they leave the nest. So, so they should never be found on the ground, especially uh, swifts because they have really tiny legs and um, they can't fly once grounded. So in that case, we should seek help if we find a swift or a barn swallow. Good advice there from BirdLife Cyprus, Elena Marquitani, on what to do if you find a baby bird that's not in its nest. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralampas. For the first time in five years, 
the car importers in Cyprus are getting together to put on a motor show. It's being coordinated by the Employers and Industrialists Federation, OEV, and I'm going to speak shortly to their chairman, Christos Mikhailidis. But first of all, let me remind you that cars were one of the first things that came off people's shopping lists after the haircut and the bailout in 2013. Hence, there hasn't been a motor show here in Cyprus. It was a very popular part of the calendar each year, but for five years we haven't had one. So it's all going to happen between the 4th and the 7th of May, and Mr Mikhailidis told me how they'd put the whole thing together. As you correctly said, the recession has affected tremendously the sector of the economy. We realise that, you know, that it's also acting or has a role of indicating the tendencies, we realize that the tendencies are becoming positive again. And so we believe that this way we, we give an injection to the sector. We will also push generally consumption that is needed within the market. And that was the main objective to put together and of course to give the right information to the consumer that uh, these were the ob objectives actually of, of uh, re-establishing uh, this motor show. You've said in your address to the press today that you want to do it step by step, but there are people who might suggest that since you're coming back after five years, you need to, as we'd say, pull in the punters. So you need interactive stuff. You need exciting things to get people to say, oh yes, we'll go up and we'll have a look at those cars. You are right. Uh, there are different perceptions as to how to go about it. Certainly, um, we strongly believe that uh, the exhibition would be anyway impressive, very much informative, uh, which is a major objective. And um, people, we have the opportunity really to get acquainted of new trends and possibilities and brands and so forth. So the major object, this is a major objective. Uh, this was a focusing point. Certainly, one should take into consideration other parameters that may enrich um, the overall exhibition. And this will take that into consideration, whatever is possible to be done uh, now and in the future. But it is that interaction that gets people excited and they want to go. So have you got anything other than just the cars in the showrooms at the exhibition? Are they, I think I'm thinking that in the past the police had their safety belt mm -hmm. machine that mm -hmm. it sent you down a little hill and bang, people started wearing safety belts because they saw what could happen if they didn't and they felt the impact of a crash. I remember years ago Toyota bringing one of their Formula One cars and we had a competition to see how fast people could change the wheels and things like that. Those are the things that get people not just going there and looking at the cars but staying there for several hours. Of, of course, all these ideas is to be considered, as I said, and, uh, but uh, we still believe that the major reason somebody is visiting is to get the right information. Furthermore, I fully agree with you, we should take into consideration such issues. I think the only interaction to whichever extent will be via the importers uh, themselves within their kiosk whatever interaction parameters or issues they will develop themselves. Okay, so where and when is this happening? It's on the, between the 4th and the 7th, and it's taking place at the old uh, Fair State uh, Exhibition uh, area. So that's the Motor Show 2017, the first one we've had here in Cyprus for five years. Pretty well all the importers, I think there's only a couple missing, are going to be there. If you want to see what's on the market, head down to the old state fair at Makedonidisa in Nicosia between May the 4th and May the 7th.
Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.